We're looking at a passage here. This is Philippians 4, verse 2, and we're going to go right up to verse 9. And before we start looking at our passage, I want us to think about the context. The most important thing, really, in studying the Bible, the most important principle is always consider the context. Never take a passage out of its context, because when you take a passage out of its context, when you take text out of context, you are left with a con, like people say. And the, the background context of this passage is Paul is in prison in Rome. And Paul is not just in prison, he's writing to the church in Philippi, the first church he founded in the Roman province of Macedonia. And he's writing to people he knows well, people who have partnered with him in ministry. And he's writing to be grateful for their partnership and give them thanks. And something we notice about this letter is that even though Paul is writing from prison, the theme that runs through the whole book is one of joy. He is in chains in Rome, but he's writing to people outside and he's writing from such a place of joy. And that just helps me really to be able to remember that no matter my difficulties, joy is something that can can really supersede that it comes from the Lord and we can rejoice regardless of our, our circumstances. Now, we also notice something that runs throughout the book of Ephesians uh, and that seems to underlie what Paul says in the, the lessons that he talks about is that there is serious conflict within the church at Philippi. And this conflict is not just any kind of conflict. It is conflict that is occurring between two women that have both labored at Paul's side. It's conflict that is happening uh, among believing Christians that are serious believers, not just any kind of Christian. And so uh, Paul really gets to this portion here and addresses that conflict head on in a way that gives us nine principles that we're going to look at that are going to be able to help us to be able to thrive no matter the kind of relationship that we have, whether it's on the job or with the children, it was with spouses or people we just meet. It doesn't matter. These nine principles are going to apply to help us be able to deal well with our relationships. Uh, as far as the the internal context, the surrounding context that comes before and after this text, we see that Paul, this text appears towards the end of the letter. In Paul introduces the letter and then gives thanks to uh, to the to the Philippians and prays for them for their partnership in the gospel. Then he talks about the fact that his chains are helping advance the gospel in, in chapter 1. And then he moves on and gives them the command to conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. And he addresses that from the end of chapter 1 to, to chapter 4 verses 9, which is at the section that our passage is found. So at the tail end of this conversation, this command that Paul gives them to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, he brings this idea of, of really pursuing unity and rejoicing always in the Lord and addressing this conflict from that point of view. Okay, so with that context now, let's look at our passage indeed. Now, we see here Paul says, I entreat Eudea and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Eudea and Syntyche are having issues and Paul is addressing them. Agree with each other in the Lord. The first principle that we see here is the principle of negotiation. Okay, this is the time to write if you're taking notes. Now, negotiation simply means that when you are in a conflict with someone, you go to them and talk to them one-on-one -on -one and explain to them what it is you're seeing and work with them to be able to address the issue. 
You don't need anybody at this point. Jesus, in the book of Matthew, I think it's Matthew 18, talks about this from verse 15 to 20, talks about this approach of going to see your brother. If your brother sins against you, go to him, just you and him alone, and address it. Okay, so Paul brings that approach here. And we see that that's our number one point, negotiation. And then the next thing Paul says, Yes, I ask you, true companion, help these women. There are many thoughts about who this true companion may be. That this true companion may be Epaphroditus, it may be somebody else within the church. But whoever it is, the true companion is supposed to help these women who have labored by, uh, side by side with me in the gospel uh, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. So likely these women are thought of by Paul to also be people whose names are written in the in the book of life. And they are committed Christians that have worked with him side by side and they're having this issue. And Paul is telling them here, telling this true companion to help these women. That introduces us to our second principle, which is, mediation you're going to have conflicts with people sometimes that trying to address the conflict with them one on one and helping be able, helping them see where you're coming from and apologizing for what you've done and trying to get them to be able to see where they've gone wrong also so they too can apologize and repent and the relationship can be restored that it's not going to work at some point you might need some third person who is going to be a neutral party, somebody both of you respect, you bring this person into the picture and ask for their help to be able to help the two of you to be able to uh, overcome the difficulty, the conflict that you're going through. So that's mediation. The next thing here Paul says in, uh, in, in, in verse 4 here, Rejoice in the Lord always. This is another principle here, the third principle we're looking at. Conflict is something that is very common. And conflict is one of the greatest stressors that we have as humans. In my work as a primary care doctor, I see lots of people on a weekly basis that come into the clinic that if you look back, you see their, their anxiety and depression and different things that they're suffering from that sometimes need medication and therapy, it comes from conflict and steals their joy. And they, they spend a lot of time worrying and worrying and worrying and getting anxious and depressed. And this really never makes the conflict better, this kind of worry. Something that I've discovered in my own life is that when I instead in those very difficult times, turn to the Lord and I am able to look for reasons in the Lord to be happy. The things the Lord has done for me, the blessings He's given me, the, 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 the many more important things that the Lord has done and is doing and will do and has called me to do, that it makes the conflict almost small and tried. Not that it's the matter is not important, but it loses its importance when I compare it with other things and I just rejoice in the Lord. So remembering to rejoice in the Lord is absolutely a very, very crucial thing. It takes your mind off of the conflict. So the fourth thing that we're looking at here, it, Paul reminds them here again, I, I will say rejoice, emphasizing the importance of rejoicing. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. That's our fourth principle. And that is the principle of behaving reasonably, being considerate. Many times when we're in a conflict, we have the flight, uh, fight and freeze response turned on. And our autonomic nervous system, uh, our neuroendocrine glands, they're, they're kicked in. And we almost start acting from our limbic brain and, and stuff like that. And we see the other person as an enemy. We almost feel like we have to get them out of the way. They are getting in our way and they are taking away our joy. And so we start becoming unreasonable. We become inconsiderate in the way we act. When we're in a conflict, we need to remind ourselves 
to be reasonable, to see the other person as a human being who is also just operating from the script, from the experiences that they also have gone through, and they're seeing the world from their point of view. They are just as honest, likely, as us and just trying to do what they can. Even though we disagree, we should avoid in this kind of situations, seeing them as the enemy and seeing and impugning on their motives uh, uh, because that will make us uh, not act reasonably. So the, for, the, 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 the principle of behaving reasonably is our fourth principle. The fifth one, the Lord is at hand. This one is a powerful one. The, just knowing that the Lord is at hand when you're in a conflict, what does Paul mean here by the Lord is at hand? It means the Lord Jesus is coming soon. That time is passing. The world as we know it is coming to an end. Soon, sooner than we think. When you look at the, the, the grand scope and grand scheme of things, the, the time we have on earth is so small and time is passing. The Lord is coming very soon. When we think about that, we can really, again, focus on the things that matter most and realize that the Lord is going to come and he will bring justice. If the other person is wrong or if I am wrong, the Lord, will, the Lord knows everything. He's coming and we can focus on him. That's our fifth thing to think about when you're in a conflict. And the sixth one, do not be anxious about anything. Okay, this is so this is so key because when we're in a conflict, like I said earlier, that's when our nervous system and our brains are just they, they prime us for anxiety, for meditating, for spending time worrying, regurgitating and rethinking about what happened and how the person hurt us and only getting more and more angry and more and more anxious. Paul tells us here, do not be anxious about anything. And that's something we need to remind ourselves. Do not be anxious about anything. And Paul tells us the alternative. Instead of sitting there worrying and being anxious, I should tell myself, go to the Lord in prayer. Take everything to the Lord in prayer. Paul says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Instead of sitting there worrying, which is going to do me no good, we remember Jesus in the Sermon on the, uh, on the Mount talking about anxiety. We can't grow a single hair by worrying. Okay? And we, worrying changes nothing. But what can change something, absolutely, in my life, in your life, is when we wise Christians is when you and I, instead of sitting there worrying, because we know that that's not what wise Christians would do. That's not what wise followers of Christ would do. That's not what wise people who are surrendered to the Lord would do. Instead, we should take our concerns to the Lord by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. We should let our requests be known to the Lord. That is one of the most powerful ones. Prayer. Genuine prayer. And when you go to pray, you know what Jesus teaches about prayer. When you go to pray, you must forgive your brother. So that our Father in heaven may forgive us too. When you go to pray, you must love your brother. And do good to those who, help, who, who hate you. Because we are children of our Father in heaven. So going in prayer and actually praying, not only for yourself and for the situation, but for the other person, praying that God will help you to be able to see the situation as truthfully as God sees it and to be as gracious as God wants you to be is a powerful, powerful thing in dealing with conflict. And he continues here. And... And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, there's a cause-effect relationship almost that Paul seems to be pointing here. Uh, prayer, 
when you pray, the result is that you're going to have the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guarding your hearts. And that's exactly what you and I need in a conflict situation. What we need is the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guarding our hearts. So, wise Christians, the most important thing to do, I think, in a conflict is to be able to do number seven. Genuinely pray and allow God to be sovereign, sovereign, completely sovereign when you pray. Allow God to be sovereign in the sense that you truly know that God controls everything in the universe, that not a hair can fall from your head. No one can hurt you. Nothing can happen to you. The person you are in a conflict with cannot hurt you, even if they tried, if God does not allow it. And if God allows it, he certainly plans to use it for good. See the Lord as sovereign and submit to his will. That's what you and I, that's my prayer for myself and that's my prayer for you that you will do that when you have a conflict. And our next point, okay, Paul continues, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is Honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. This is a powerful one. A powerful principle. In a conflict, I already explained earlier that we tend to be anxious prone. Our biologies prime us like that. This is something that if we just do nothing, we're going to be anxious and worried and have palpitations and have anxiety and, and it will ruin our lives. But what we can do, instead of meditating on the issue and worrying and causing anxiety, instead, Paul calls us to meditate or think about what is good, honorable. This is the replacement principle. Replace the negative worry with worrying about stuff that is more life-giving and important and spend time thinking about God and His goodness. And in fact, in fact, in fact, do this if you are in a close relationship with someone, with a spouse, a brother, a parent. Think about the good things that that person represents, how good they have been to you in the past. And how good they are as a person. You can do this even for a stranger or somebody at work. Think about them as a person and just think about how helpful they are to others, to their children, to their family, and see them as a human being. Because one of the things that happens in a conflict is that we tend to objectify other people. We t tend to see them as obstacles and things and not as fellow human beings. Thinking about what is good, meditating on what is good is, is awesome here. And then Paul, the ninth principle here is what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. That is, the ninth principle is to imitate godly leaders. Paul was a godly leader for them and Paul wants them to imitate him so those are the principles from number one negotiation the second one mediation the third one rejoice in the lord always the fourth one behave reasonably and be considerate the fifth one know the lord is at hand the sixth one don't be anxious about anything the seventh pray about everything and give thanks the, the eighth meditate think about what is good honorable and number nine, imitate godly leaders. I trust, brothers and sisters, that if you do this, you will be acting as a wise Christian, the wise Christians that we are. If you and I do this, we will be acting as wise Christians and we will be glorifying our God in our actions and God will work all things for our good. I hope this video was a blessing to you. If it has been, please don't forget to, to like, and subscribe and share this video with somebody that can be uh, that can find it useful and
My prayer for all of us is that God will help us to become the wise Christians that he has called us to be, to walk in faith and to do his will and to bring glory to him in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'll see you in the next video.